Well, it's morning, so we are doing a series on the last week of Jesus Christ on the earth. And we've already learned that when he came into Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, where he had been already many times, this was his final visit. And he knew that. He knew he was going to the cross to die for us. And the cross was not a good way to die. It was something the Romans came up with. And one of the things that the Romans were very good at, they were very good at coming up with torture devices. He did not want to be killed by the Romans. The cross was such a, a, a horrible thing in decent society. He didn't talk about it. You know, we wear around our neck, you know, like a symbol, like, oh, look at my nice pretty cross. It wasn't like that back then. The, the, the Jews hated the cross because it symbolized Roman oppression. Because they, they would crucify Jewish people. And it was, it was a sign of, of, of them being stronger than us. So the Jewish people hated the cross. Not just because of how, how uh, painful it was, but because of how embarrassing and uh, just downright just horrible it was. Now for a Roman, wow, Romans didn't talk about crosses because as a Roman citizen, you almost never got crucified on a cross unless you were really, really, really bad. Because Roman citizens had special privileges. We see that in the Bible when they wanted to beat Paul and Paul says, I'm a Roman citizen and the guy goes, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. And you realize, oh, I can't treat a Roman citizen this way. But Roman citizens were crucified on crosses, historians tell us, but you have to be like the worst of the worst. So the cross was something that was either for non-Romans or it was for just the worst offenders at all. So if you were at dinner parties, nobody had a cross necklace. Nobody even talked about the crosses. That's, you know, now some of the, you know, the riffraff, they might go around with people crucified and they would gather around and make fun of the people that were being crucified. But if you were, you know, proper, you didn't do that. The cross is, is a shameful thing. In fact, the Bible talks about despising the shame of the cross. And yet, what we didn't know as Christians is see God take that horrible symbol and make it beautiful. And now the Apostle Paul, because of what happened on the cross, we're going to talk about that this morning, he can say, I boast in the cross of Christ. And he says, amazingly, in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. You, it, nobody would say that, ever. You wouldn't say, I've been crucified with Christ. You know, no, we don't talk about crucifixion. No, 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 that's not the polite society. We don't do that. We don't talk about that. That's probably taboo. And, and Paul boasts, says, I have been crucified with Christ. I don't care. I just love Christ so much because of what Christ did on the cross, what Jesus did. And I hope my prayer for you guys is that you will come, if you don't already, you will come to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Not just that intellectual belief in your mind, like, oh, I believe that, you know, I often tell people that, you know, you can believe that a parachute can save you from a plane if you're up 30,000 feet in the air. And you can say, yep, I believe that if I jump out with a parachute, I know that the surface area of the parachute, the, the, the wind resistance, and, and, and it will, you know, I can do all the physics and draw you schematics and show you that I will land and I won't smush on the ground. But then what happens if someone who believes that, says they believe that, they jump out of a plane without the parachute on? Smush, thank you. Very good, smush. It's a good smush. Um, intellectual belief in your head, does it help you at all? There's a lot of people who intellectually believe, oh yeah, Jesus is, you know, yeah, he died on the cross, he was from the dead, all that. But unless you internalize it and, 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 and he becomes your savior, your personal savior, and you have a relationship with him, it's like jumping out of a plane without a parachute. So that's what I want to talk to you about. Yesterday's message, uh, we, we, we talked about how, even though Jesus came into Jerusalem and everybody goes, yay, what's that, everybody, Jesus, woohoo, throw palm branches on, thank you, like a king. You know, once he started teaching, they realized, wait a second, you know, the Romans aren't getting thrown out here, this isn't, he's not the, the, the savior that I wanted him to be. And then, you know, the crowd started going, and crucify him, crucify him, and everybody started, yeah, crucify him, crucify him, they turned on him. They turned on him, and they beat him. Remember yesterday, it was kind of a nasty message. You know, but they asked me to teach in the Bible. And the Bible sometimes has nasty stuff in it. Because it's true. It talks about real life. And it's not, this isn't a happy, go lucky message, but it's important to know this. So yesterday we talked about how Jesus was brought before Pilate, and Pilate said, I don't find any fault in him. 
but he crucified him anyway because Pilate was a coward. And he, he bowed to peer pressure. And they beat Jesus, they spit on him, and they beat him with a cat of nine tails, this is metal instrument they could whip people with, that they put shards of, of metal and bone and things in, and many people die right there. Because they said, you know, it's, just, it's a disgusting thing. I mean, I know it's, I'm not here to like gross you out, but again, this is true. You need to know all this. So that's where Jesus was. So we start today with the story of the crucifixion, we're going to the crucifixion and the burial of Christ. And so, remember, Jesus has been up all night. You guys have been up all night but not getting enough sleep? I have. How do you feel in the morning? Oh, you feel like cranky and tired and it's like, oh, yeah, 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 It's like, you can't do anything. So remember, Jesus has been up all night because he had been taken. Now, he is God, but he's also man, too. And we talked about that, that God is, 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 is a trinity and, and Jesus is, is, is fully God and fully man. And as a man, he's tired. He had been carted before Pilate and, 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 and the high priest and taken here and taken there. And he had never got a lot of sleep. He had been beaten physically worse than any of us have ever been beaten. And in fact, so bad that he couldn't even carry his own cross. They had to grab a guy from the crowd and say, hey, you, come here. And they grabbed him and they put the cross on, on him. His name was Simon of Cyrene. And the scriptures record that. Why do the scriptures record that? To show how weak he was. And, and, and Jesus wasn't some weak guy. I and mean, he spent 30 years as a carpenter, lugging around big pieces of wood and, and logs and things and putting together with big hammers. And you know, they didn't have pneumatic, you know, uh, uh, tools and, and you know, like I have a my favorite tool is my, my my cordless 18 volt drill. I love that. You can have that, you got know, that nail things in. And he had to you know, he didn't have one of those, you know, the, the air compressor. You know, no. I mean, he was a strong guy. And yet, even in his strength, the Bible tells us he did not have enough strength to carry his cross. Because he was weakened. He was beaten so badly. They took him to the place of the skull of Golgotha. A horrible place. Outside the city. Outside the city. Why outside the city? Because we don't do this nasty stuff in our nice city of Jerusalem. We're going to kill somebody through one side. So the, seriously. I mean, this is like, this is disgusting stuff. And what they did was they, after Jesus was, was, was tired and beaten and made fun of and spit upon and all of these things, they put him on the cross. And how do they fasten people to a cross? Nails. Nails in his hands. He has his feet. Can't draw the one from the feet. Because it's below my paper. Um, not a good way. And not only that, he was already bloody from, from the beatings he had taken. Um, not good. Not good. And then, remember, he, they said that he was, he was a king. So what did the Roman soldiers do to make fun of him? You remember? Crown of thorns. Anybody ever get tricked by a thorn? How's it feel? Not so good. Well, the thorns they had in, 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 the, in the Middle East, in, in Israel, I mean, these are, from, these are hard thorns. These are long thorns. Um, and they stuck it on his, on his head. All these thorns. And those, those are rough thorns. That's not like just, oh, kind of thorn. No, that, that would make him bleed from his head. This is not a good thing. And there's Jesus. On the cross. Why? Why? So, do you think anybody felt bad for him? The Roman soldiers, you know what they did? They, they continued to mock him. They took his clothes, because usually when you were crucified, now, um, you know, you got some young kids here, so I drew them with a, a towel around. Uh, I see my wife helping with the paintings, she did a very nice job. Um, but most people were crucified naked, and he didn't have clothes. And you know what the Roman soldiers did? They, they cast lots and drew dice or whatever you want to call it and, and to see who would win his clothes. Now his clothes had no value. His clothes were criminal. So they were joking. They were making fun of him. So it's important to know that the soldiers were, were, were doing that. They, 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 they took his clothes and they, and they, uh, they, they basically gambled for him. Okay? And not only that, but then they surrounded him and, and yelled at him and, and, and 
hurled insults at him. They pierced his hands and his feet. You know, when you're crucified, um, you, uh, you, does anybody know how you die when you get crucified? What actually kills you? What do you think? I'm sorry, if you have a sweet little voice, I can't hear you. Can you say, get shout a little louder or have someone else around you try it? They do break their leg bones. Um, they didn't with Jesus, but there's a reason why, and actually you're very close. Anybody know who you are? No, 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 that's not what kills you, because you can go a couple days without water and food. Yeah, in the blue shirt. That's you? Suffocation. Suffocation, exactly. That's what actually kills you. Because what happens is, if, when you're stretched out like this, everybody's stretched out like this. Now, push yourself up on your legs. Okay. That's how you breathe. Okay, you can also sit down. You can also sit down. In order to breathe, when you're, when you're like this, you have to push yourself up on your legs, <gasps> take a breath, <sighs> and then you go back down. So you have to use your leg muscles in order to push up, in order to fill your lungs. But what happens is eventually your legs, just through pain and, and suffering, they give up, your muscles stop working, and you can't push up anymore. And what, what happens is you, you just you suffocate to death. You suffocate to death. Horrible way to die. Um, that's why they would break their legs. Because if they wanted to speed it up, because it would take hours and hours and hours for this to happen. Um, so if they want to speed up, you just break your legs. Because once your legs are broken, then you can't push up on your legs anymore, and then you'll suffocate to death. And that'll, that'll speed it up. That, that's, that's, that's why those smart you say about the leg broken. Um, another thing that happens is your heart will give out. Um, and uh, in fact, one of the things that happened is one of the Roman soldiers put a spear in Jesus' side. What came out? Blood and water. The Gospel of John notes that not only did blood come out, which we would expect, but water came out too. And that's very interesting because modern day uh, doctors have, have looked at that and said, why would a first century author write about water coming out? It's actually the clear fluid that would be produced by your, by your heart under that kind of stress. See, the Bible is so accurate. It even talks about medical things that they didn't even understand at the time. But that's exactly what would happen if somebody was crucified, that, uh, uh, that their heart would, would, would pump that kind of fluid out. And this is pretty serious stuff here. So here he is, surrounded by his enemies, who, who, who are you know, trying to get his clothes and making insults at him, and his hands and feet are pierced. All of that. Question for you. How many books are there in the Bible? Yes. 66? Good answer. Wrong. Anybody else? 69? Good answer. Wrong. Okay, it's a trick question. Um, the actual answer is one. It's one book? I mean, yes, there are 66 individual books. You were right. I'm sorry. Okay. They need to pick on you. You're right. There are 66 individual books, but really, it's one. It's one author, the Holy Spirit, right? And he used uh, godly men to write it, but the whole thing is one big thing. All of this that is happening in the Gospels, in the New Testament, it's not like, oh, some new thing that happened. This was all prophesied ahead of time. It's all one big book. I want to read to you from Psalm 22. Now, what is one of the last things that Jesus said on the cross? He said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me, or why have you abandoned me? Now, here's a little biblical tip for you. Jesus is God. Whenever God asks a question in the Bible, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. Okay? He knows the answer. There's a reason why he asks questions. Do you think Jesus didn't know why this was happening to him? No, he knew what was going on. He was quoting scripture. And all the people who were around them, all the Jewish authorities, they knew their Bible really, really well. They, they went to their Awana and all that stuff. Uh, they had Awana back then. But they went to their equivalent. And they had studied. And they knew the Psalms particularly because the Psalms were their hymn book. You know, they have U.S. hymn books at their church. Right? And you get to know them pretty well. You know, you have your favorite hymns and all that. Well, their hymn book was the Psalms. So they knew all of them, especially the Psalms of David. In Psalm 22, it starts off 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So Jesus on the cross, having all this happen to him, and he starts, and he says, Oh, he's going to speak. He's going to speak. What's he going to say? Is he going to say, I'll let you down? Or is he going to say, What's he going to say? He says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And they all would have said, Hey, that's Psalm 22. Let's read Psalm 22. I'm going to start at about verse 12. I have the English Standard Version, but it should be pretty much the same in any other version. It says, Many bulls encompass me, surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a raving and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. Heart is like wax. The heart is giving up. It's like there's water coming out here. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. That's interesting. I want everybody to stick their tongue on the top of their roof of their mouth and see if they can get it to stick. Okay? Now drop your tongue. Did it stick? No. Why didn't it stick? You have water in your mouth, specifically saliva. What happens when you suffocate? You don't have any more saliva. Your mouth dries up. Anybody ever get their mouth all dry? Yeah. Is that a good feeling? No. But if you're suffocating, that's what's going to happen. It's talking about suffocation here. My tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Does that sound familiar? A bunch of dogs surrounding him, his enemies surrounding him, and they pierced his hands and his feet. That's, that's what happened here. I can count all my bones. See, Jesus, they didn't break any of Jesus' bones. He can count all of them. And they stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. They cast lots of my clothing? Is this written in the New Testament? No, this is written in the Old Testament. They're talking about somebody here is getting their hands and feet pierced. Their, their, their mouth is drying up. Their heart is giving up. The people around them are gambling for clothes. They stare and gloat over me. Does that sound familiar to you? That's why I say the Bible is one book. Do you know that this, what I just read to you, was written 1,000 years before Christ? A thousand years. And about the, the, the hands and feet being pierced, crucifixion wasn't even invented yet when that was written. The Bible is God's Word. It's one book. We can trust every single word in it. This is a really good time to say amen. Because I'm an evangelist and I, I share my faith on the street, I, I don't just speak to children like you. I love speaking to children like you, but a lot of times I speak with adults. And especially I go to colleges and I'll speak with college students and, and I'll go to uh, the cities. And a lot of people want to argue about the Bible. And I don't want to argue with anybody. I just want to share the words of life. But what I'll do is I'll point to prophecy. They'll say, well, how do you believe the Bible? I mean, you know, why do you believe in the Koran? Why do you believe in something else? And I say, because there's no other book. I point to Psalm 22. I point to Isaiah 22. I point to Jeremiah, I point to all these things, and they all talk about Jesus before it happened. The Bible is one book. Genesis to Revelation. 66 individual books, but it's one. And it's amazing. I love the Bible. You know why they make you have devotions here at camp? Some of you, you know, come on. I know some of you are like, all right, devotion time. The reason why? It's because it's good for you. It is the Word of God. God Himself wrote that book. And we should spend time in it. And we should learn to understand it. I know you can understand all of it. I'm 39 years old. I don't understand all of it. But let me tell you, I didn't know about Jesus until I was 19 years old. You're all way ahead of me. Okay? So you guys are whacking my own children that. They're way ahead of me. So you start reading God's Word. You hide it in your heart. You learn it. Memorize it. And obey it. And God's Word will work in you in such a powerful way. It's amazing. Amazing. Here we have Jesus doing exactly what the Bible said. Exactly. What else is going on here? Now, in the one book of the Bible, in the, in the books of Moses, it talks about a tabernacle. We're, we call this building the tabernacle. That's a biblical word. 
So they had a tabernacle back then. Before, and then eventually they had a temple. And that's where there was a place called the Holy of Holy Places. Now you, you've probably heard of this in the beginning of the Gospels. Remember uh, John's father, Zechariah? He went in there and, they, and an angel met him there and said, you will have a son and you will name him John the Baptist. Well, the Holy of Holy Places was a place that only one person was allowed to go only once a year. It was a big deal. You had to be from a certain tribe of Israel, and then even from then, you had to be from a specific group, and even from then, it was a huge honor to be that one person. Most people never got to be the person to go into the Holy of Holy Places. But here's the Holy of Holy Places. Only one person is going only once a year. Anybody know what happened to Aaron's sons when they tried to go in there the wrong time? In the wrong way? They died. Because this is serious. It's not that God's a big meaning, it's that he's serious about his holiness. When Jesus died, that curtain that separated the holy of holy place miraculously tore in two and opened up. Do you know why? Because we can boldly enter the holy of holy whenever we want. Not just one person once a year. This is what Jesus, one of the things Jesus did for us, is now we can enter God's presence anytime we want. It used to be that you wanted to enter God's presence once a year, and you had to be a special person, you had to win the lottery, so to speak, and you, only one person could do it, and only once a year. Now, we can enter God's presence whenever we want, all the time. In fact, if we're the temple of God, if we have the Holy Spirit living in us, which you do, which you will. If you know Christ, if Christ is your Savior, then you're the temple of God. And you can approach him anytime you want. That's what Jesus did. You know another thing that Jesus did for us? In the very beginning, we're going to talk about this in, the, in our morning, in our, our evening sessions. Um, we've got Adam and we've got Eve. Remember, I was drawing Eve with nice hair. And when they took of the forbidden fruit, they realized, Ah! We're naked! Ah! And what are we going to do? We're going to cover ourselves with fig leaves. And you know what? That didn't work. God doesn't want you covered in fig leaves. He wants you covered in the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. And to symbolize that, God killed a lamb and made leather clothes for them. In order to make leather clothes, it needs to be a definite animal. That's what Jesus did. He took our, our ridiculous fig leaves that we tried to do to, to cover ourselves. And he covered us in his blood. All the way back to Genesis, filling it. You know, another thing, there was somebody else in the garden, remember? Who else was in the garden? There was a little snake there, right? And he was a liar, and he said, you can eat the fruit, it's okay, God doesn't know what he's talking about. And in Genesis, chapter 3, the Bible says that the snake will bruise the heel of the Son of God, but the Son of God will crush his head. Make no mistake, Jesus is bruised. He's just his heel, so to speak. And when Jesus died on the cross, he took Satan and sin, and he crushed his head. That is a good time for an amen. amen. That is pathetic. Amen. Sin, the devil, is destroyed forever. Amen. Amen. This is great. Now, when we go to heaven, we will see the culmination of that. That's one of the things that's so great about heaven, is that it's going to be no more sin. No, and, and no more effects of sin. We see sadness and sickness and, and despair and all of these things are going to be gone forever because of what Jesus did on the cross. Now there are two people who died along with Jesus. There was a thief on this side and a thief on this side. And one of them said, you know, you're nothing, Jesus. You're nobody. If you're so great, you know, prove it to me. And the other one said, wait a second, we've done no wrong. I mean, we've done wrong, but he hasn't. And he said, Lord, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. He acknowledged his own sin. He acknowledged that Jesus was sinless. And he, he begged Jesus to please have mercy on him. You know what he did? When he acknowledged his own sin, that what he did was wrong, and that Jesus is perfect, he did something called... Repent. Repent is when instead of saying, you know, why do you hate your brother? Oh, you're even looking 
can't be funny. No, that's not a repentant attitude. A repentant attitude said, I was wrong. I hit my brother. I did something awful. That's what he did. That's what this, this one did. He said, we deserve to be up here. You know, most criminals go over there and say, I, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. Even though they are guilty most of the time. But this one wasn't like that. He said, I'm guilty. I did my crime. But Jesus didn't. That's repentance. I want all of you, when you sin, and you will sin, I want you all, instead of blaming others, I want you to say, I did it. And I was wrong. Jesus, please forgive me. And when he looked to Jesus, and he said, please Jesus, remember me and bring me into your kingdom. What he did there was he... Right. He believed. And that's exactly what we need to do. You know, you know why Jesus did this? So that we would repent and believe. <coughs> repent and believe. If we repent and believe, then we will be forgiven. Do you know that Pilate, he would always put an inscription, he would take a board and put on it, what the person who was being crucified did wrong? Well, he didn't know what to put on Jesus's. Remember what Pilate said? He said, I find no fault in this man. I don't think that he's guilty of anything. So the most he could come up with was this. On the top, he wrote, I heard somebody say it. King of the Jews. And that's what he had written on above his head. Because he didn't do anything else. Could Jesus have had murderer put above his head? No, because he wasn't a murderer. Could Jesus have had liar put above his head? No. Could Jesus have had insurrectionist put on top of his head? No. Could Jesus have had adulterer put on top of his head? No. Everybody, grab a piece of wood in your mind, put it above your head. I want to see everybody's hand above their head. This is a piece of wood that's above your head. I want you to examine yourself. Be humble. What is written on your piece of wood? Have you ever lied? The Bible says you shall not lie. Have you ever lied? Yes, we all have. That makes us a liar. Put a liar on your board. Have you ever stolen anything? You know, you don't, have to, you don't have to steal the Mona Lisa from the Louvre, that's where it is, to be a thief. If you take a, a penny, you're a thief. If you take something off the internet that doesn't belong to you, you're a thief. You can put thief right above on that board. Have you ever dishonored your parents? Real easy, if your parents ever had to tell you twice to do the same thing. I know four kids that need to put that on there. Probably a whole lot more. You put that on your board. Have you ever wanted something that didn't belong to you? Yeah. Oh, I want someone's Nintendo Wii. I want their iPhone. I want their, their, their whatever. They put that on there. That's coveting. Have you ever not been thankful for what God has given you? Well, that's breaking the first commandment. You know, we're all guilty of all ten commandments. And even if we're not, the Bible says, he who's kept the whole law and yet broken it in one place, James, the Apostle James says, has broken all the law. You're bored. I want you to put it on Jesus Christ. If you're bored, put it on Jesus Christ. But only if you have repented and believed. If you haven't, I don't want you to repent and believe because everybody else is. I don't want that. If you don't want to repent and believe, then, then, then you don't. We do not want false converts. But if God's Holy Spirit is convicting you, and you realize, and you say, I did these things on my board, and I continue to do them. I've done them today. I continue to do them. Don't blame it on other people. Don't blame it on the, the weather or that you are up too late. Blame it on yourself, because we're all sinful. If you can do that, if you have a truly repentant attitude, 
and you believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, then take your board and put it on Jesus. Because then what he did was he ripped that, that curtain so you can enter God's presence anytime you want. He took your ridiculous fig leaves and put real garments of righteousness on you. He took the devil and sin and crushed it for you. That's what Jesus did. Even a Roman centurion, now a Roman centurion did not have a religious background, even he looked up at Jesus and saw all that was going on and he said, certainly this man is the Son of God. You know, you don't have to have a theological background. It's great. My, my subject, most of you come from a Christian home. You're a Christian camp after all. But not all of you. But if you have a Christian home, that's great. Because that helps prepare you. But even someone like a Roman centurion, who's never heard anything, ever. When they see this, even they can believe. So if you're here because, you know, you just wanted to come to camp, but you don't have a Christian background, or you didn't come from a Christian home, and, or maybe you're kind of, there's a lot of the Bible you don't know. You know what? You can repent and believe too. Just like this Roman centurion. Just like this thief. Please, don't be like this thief that says, eh, I don't need Jesus. Why did Jesus do this? He did it to rescue us. And they took him and they put him in a grave and sealed it up and put Roman soldiers in front of it. And there he is in the grave for three days. And that's where we're going to end today. But we will tomorrow we're going to talk about more about how Christ fulfilled the Old Testament. And then the next day we're going to talk about something really wonderful. The resurrection. So I'm going to pray for you guys. Oh, do I get over here afterwards? Okay. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for your kindness, your goodness, and what you've done. This disgusting death that you did on a cross. A cross that was a symbol of shame. A cross that was that, that good people in society don't even mention. That they didn't have anything to write above your head because you did no wrong. And yet you did this for us. We, we couldn't find a board big enough to write our sins on. And you did this. You, you took the fig leaves of Adam and Eve and you gave them the righteous clothing. You took Satan and you destroyed him. You took that curtain that separated us from God and you ripped it in half. God, even a, a centurion, a Roman soldier, can see that certainly you are the Son of God. I pray that everybody here will truly repent and believe. And God, I thank you that you spent time in the grave, that you, you were put there. And I thank you for the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we will get to in a few days. God, thank you so much. Uh, God, I know this was not a fun lesson to talk about, but I pray that the kids uh, on this rainy day, on this, on this gloomy day, will think about this, these things, and they'll think about their own sin, and that they will, they will run to the Savior. Thank you, Jesus. We love you so much. Please fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can live as you want us to. We praise you in Jesus' name.